Welcome to the Octagon, everyone, and a very good evening to all of you. My name is Stephen Lewis. I'm the immediate past president of the AIA Architects Foundation Board. We're sitting in the home of the AIA Architects Foundation. We um, have uh, ownership and stewardship of this historic site. After COVID closed this down, which was operating as a house museum, we were rethinking how to make the building and the site more relevant after COVID was over and we reopened. And uh, that along with a notion of some stories that were talked around but never talked to having to do with the events and significance of this building as a historical site um, left some holes and curiosities. And I will say, uh, before I go any further, I want to acknowledge the really incredible dedicated staff of the Architects Foundation, Marcy Reed, our executive director, Amanda Malloy in the back, Amanda Ferrario, tending, tending house, really amazing. Um, but when we would take tours through, we would hear that President Madison lived in this house when the White House was burned down in the War of 1812, and that uh, which treaty was it that was signed? Yeah, the, treaty the, the Treaty of Ghent was signed at this table here. And then we would go down into the basement and we would see what were slave quarters. And I started asking like, well, what do we know about these stories? And uh, there were no real answers. And so that started this idea of how many stories in DC like this are unknown. So hence the launch of an initiative called Revealing Parallel Histories Hidden in Plain Sight which really, when you think about it in today, in the context of what we're doing today post-George Floyd, applies to so much. And so it's actually manifest in a speaker series. This is the second of the series. It began in December, early in December, when we convened at the National Building Museum and witnessed an amazing talk and conversation between Brent Legs with the National Trust and Andrew Filer, who wrote a book on the Rosenwald schools called A Better Life for Their Children. Highly recommend it. Um, that was videotaped and recorded by Dom, who has really been a wonderful asset to the foundation in being able to cover these things and post-produce them. So um, we hopefully will be able to make you aware of where to watch that video, because it was amazing. But not as amazing as what we're going to witness tonight, because in the spirit of revealing parallel histories hidden in plain sight, we have my good friend Nikita Reed, who hosts a podcast, and her guest, um, Sarah Schoen, Schoen, Schoenfeld, thank you, and Derek Musgrove uh, will engage in a conversation that I'm sure we will all find very interesting. And to introduce them further, I would like to bring Marcy up. Thank you, Stephen. Um, just a, a little bit of housekeeping, um, just for those of you in a, who are not aware of the Architects Foundation, in addition to being stewards of the Octagon, our mission is to attract, inspire, and invest in the next generation design community to have positive impact in the world. And we do that through a number of scholarships and grants programs, and we celebrate the stories of our scholars through programming here at the Octagon. Um, again, the uh, revealing parallel histories hidden in plain sight. The notion actually began, if you walk along 18th Street, you'll see a banner on uh, the wall that talks about the I Was Here exhibit, a permanent um, art installation to commemorate the role of the enslaved in the architectural canon that we installed late in 2020. So um, I hope you can enjoy that as well. Housekeeping wise, um, we are buttoned up for this live podcast of Tangible Remnants. Um, if you need to tippy tippy toe, you hear how squeaky the floor is. If you must tippy toe through this door and down the stairs, you'll find the restrooms and the water fountain. Um, I am holding a mic that we will use for Q&A, so I know you're going to have exciting questions as soon as the speakers conclude, but please wait until I turn on the hot mic so we can hear you on the podcast later after the fact. And again, um, Dominic Mann Visuals, I want to thank them for their uh, partnership with us, um, capturing these uh, the lecture series for us and um, bringing them to future audiences. There's also membership information on the Octagon Alliance in your seats. You're all locals. We know how to find you. We hope that you will be back for more and enjoy some of the other fun and social events we have and bring your friends here for a tour. Um, Nikita Reed, who is the mastermind behind um, Tangible Remnants, 
During her day job, she's an associate at Quinn Evans and an award-winning architect with experience in the rehabilitation and sustainable reuse of historic buildings. She's a registered architect, a lead accredited professional, and a certified passive house consultant. She serves on the board of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. She is co-chair of the Net the Zero Net Carbon Collaboration for Existing and Heritage Buildings, and she is the host of Tangible Remnants. That podcast, shame on you if you haven't heard it before, but for your reference, is a podcast for lovers of existing buildings who want to learn from the past to shape a better future. Uh, Nikita also was involved in the uh, rehabilitation and stabilization of another Talo property, Minokin, which um, is a place you should also know about. But I will turn the mic over to Nikita to introduce our other guests and to get the ball rolling tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am um, so very grateful y'all are here. Um, I will ask for a little bit of grace because this is my very first live show. Usually when I'm doing podcasts, it's Zoom, headphones, talking to people in person, but this is going to be amazing. I'm very excited about this. Um, the levels are working. I'm just checking the mic and things. Um, and thank you, Dom, for recording. So this is going to be recorded and then um, published later. So it's, we're not publishing. We're not live right now, just so you know. Breathe, it's okay for me to shift a little bit, it's all right. <laughs> and so um, I'm very grateful to be here. And so when I started the podcast, I wanted to talk about the intersection of architecture, preservation, sustainability, race, and gender, because for me, they're all connected. Um, and there's not that many people who have my vantage point in the sense where of the 100,000 licensed architects in the country, about 2% are African-Americans and 500-ish are black females. That's, so there's not many of us. Um, and then uh, partnering that with the preservation side, there's not many preservationists of color either. Um, but for me, preservation and sustainability, that's my jam. I talk about that a lot. So I will do my best not to nerd out too much. Um, but I'm very, I was invited to be here um, by one of the board members of the Washington Architecture Foundation, Constance Lai. Um, and so she was like, well, would you come do a live show? And I was like, sure, what do you want me to talk about? She's like, whatever. <laughs> cool. All right. So then I was like, well, if we're in D.C., why don't we talk about D.C.? And then when I was like, well, if I'm talking about D.C., I know exactly who I'd want to interview to talk about D.C. And it's these two lovely people to my left. Um, and so Sarah Schoenfeld, she is a historian with Prologue D.C., and we've been working together on a couple of different context studies. Um, basically, I get to be the jock on these context studies. Sarah does the narrative. We'll talk through the sites and all that. And then I get to be like, oh, that property still exists. <laughs> has brick. All right, so I get to do more of the architectural, or she's doing a lot more of the narrative, the history, the resources, which is amazing. Um, and then Derek Musgrove, he is also amazing. I met him through Sarah for another context study we were working on. Um, and so Sarah and I started working together on doing uh, 20th century civil rights sites in Washington, D.C. And then Derek joined the team for our next context study where we started looking at black power sites within DC. And for those of you who are like, well, civil rights and black power, they're the same thing. <laughs> we will get into it. <laughs> um, and so um, with that, I feel like, why don't I let each of you say a little bit about yourself and then uh, we'll get into some questions. Sure, thanks. Um, this is this is really fun to be here, so, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so I uh, am a native Washingtonian. Uh, I am a proud graduate of the DC Public Schools, and I've been back here in, in DC uh, since 2000, so I barely left. <laughs> um, I, uh, I got a master's degree in history at Northeastern University with a focus on public history, so with the intention of uh, of being a historian in the public sphere, working on exhibits, actually documentary films was sort of my first um, area that I, I was working in at um, a company called Blackside, which most famously made the series Eyes on the Prize in the 1980s, really seminal history of the civil rights movement that I grew up, sort of that's how I learned about the history of civil rights in America through that series uh, when I was you know, a teenager. Um, so, uh, in DC, uh, over the last, um, I don't know, since around 2010, maybe a little bit before then, I, I sort of like honed in on doing DC history, DC neighborhood history, um, which is really exciting for me because uh, although I had grown up in, I had grown up here, there is so much I did not know, so many neighborhoods I didn't know. Um, 
And so through that work, I worked, uh, I, I started that work as a historian for the DC Neighborhood Heritage Trails. So um, the, the series of, of signs you'll see around the city in, in lots of different neighborhoods, there's about 20 of them, uh, 20 different trails. Uh, so which which are sets of about 20 signs each in lots of different neighborhoods. I worked on a number of those uh, and um, uh, Continued that work uh, in uh, as a, a, a Co-founder of uh, the company that I'm involved with now called prologue DC and at the same time we founded a, a project called mapping segregation in Washington DC uh, which I can talk more about if there's an opportunity, but I don't want to take up all the time introducing myself. So let's stop there. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So you can see this is part of why I absolutely wanted her in this conversation. Yes, Derek, over to you. Well, first off, thank you. Thank you, Nikita. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for, for, for sitting next to me. Uh, thanks to the folks at Octagon House uh, for, uh, for having us. Um, and I'm Derek Musgrove. I, I am not a DC native. I have to start with that. Uh, but I always follow up with, and neither was Marion Barry uh, <laughs> or Chuck Brown. I could go on for, for a long time. Frederick Douglass. Um, uh, but but I, I started coming to the city in the mid-1990s and just fell in love. I, I came for the clubs up on U Street. So those of you who are a little longer in the tooth, you know, State of the Union, uh, Republic Gardens, uh, and, and, uh, and, of, and of course the Ritz, of course the Ritz downtown. Um, yeah, there you go, testifying. Um, and, and I decided after I finished, finished my degree that I was going to come back to the city and, and live here. And so that was in, in the, uh, the late 90s. Uh, settled down, really settled in the early 2000s. Um, and I stumbled into DC history along the way uh, and, and really came to love it. And so I, I wrote, co-wrote Chocolate City with uh, my, my good friend and co-author, Chris Myers-Ash, and have just been continually pulled back into DC history over uh, the, the, the subsequent years. And that has not been a bad thing. And so I, we'll get into that, though, in the question and answer. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Fair, very good. Um, well, so one of the things, uh, so one of the books that I read last year that was one of my favorites was actually Chocolate City, written or co-authored by Derek. Um, and so I wanted to start with this map. Um, and for those who are listening on the podcast, when this gets published, check the Instagram, um, at Tangible Ruminants, and to see the slides that we're talking about. Um, and so this is a map of um, New Columbia, which didn't really exist eventually. So, you know, there was this idea that there would be um, New Columbia, which is kind of outlined in the black, and then DC is there. But the main reason I wanted to show this map was to say, if you don't know why Virginia is not part of DC, or rather why Alexandria is part of Virginia and no longer part of DC, Chocolate City is definitely the book you should read. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Northern Virginia, and I learned so much more about DC and all of the, the ins and outs of it than I did even in my AP history class, so highly recommend. Um, I also love the way that the narrative is written, because it's almost, it feels very salacious almost. I was like, oh, dang, and then what happened? <laughs> what? It's like, hey, these people have been dead for like hundreds of years, but still, <laughs> it feels very much like all the tea is being spilled, and it's amazing. Um, and so, just <laughs> plug for the book, super good. Um, and so with that, Derek, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about what got you, or what started you to wanting to write Chocolate City and how that book came about. Sure, so th there's a short answer, then there's a slightly longer answer, and I'll, I'll do the short answer quickly. Uh, it's because Chris Myers-Ash uh, mm -hmm. came to me one day and said, let's write a book on DC. Okay. Uh, and I, I thought Chris was one of the most wonderful people I've met. He's an excellent writer, and I said, okay. So, so that, was, that was the main reason. Okay. The reason that he came to me with that request uh, was because I was sitting down with him a couple of weeks before, I was telling him this positively absurd story uh, about how I had first come to have to teach DC history. So I you know, started my, my first job out of graduate school at uh, the University of the District of Columbia. And uh, DC history is a core class in the history department there. But I was not teaching it when I was first hired because I knew nothing of DC history. Uh, except for a little bit of Walter Fontroy there, a little bit of Marion Barry there, I really didn't know any of the rest. Uh, and we had this policy that if your classes do not fill on the first day of school, they're canceled right then and there, oh. and you're assigned other classes. And so I was teaching, I think, US and African American history. My African American history class did not fill. Uh, I, I think I had eight students who needed 10. Oh, dang. Uh, and uh, so I went to my chair and I said, you know, what do I do? And she's like, well, what you do is you teach DC history tomorrow. <laughs> <And> I thought. <laughs> 
oh my God, this is this can't be real. Uh, and, and so I stumbled through the semester. It was a big mess. And I tell Chris this story. We're laughing about it. And I, I say at the end, you know, God, I wish there was like a, a more up to date book mm -hmm. uh, that I could have used to sort of help me with my lecture notes, but also assign to my students. Uh, and Chris was, he sort of went, went yeah, yeah, hmm. And he's like, yeah, somebody should write that book. And Chris goes, yeah, somebody should write that book. And a week later, he just, he just walks into my office and, you know, hands me a, a book proposal. And he's like, you know, do you, do you want in? Uh, and I said, I said, yes. And so that's how it sort of all happened. I stumbled into it and then Chris that's amazing. pulled me further. That's an amazing stumble. I'm very glad you stumbled and said yes. <laughs> <laughs> That book was, it's one of those ones, and I was, just, I was listening to it as opposed to reading it, but it's still like, it reads so salaciously. I was like, oh. <laughs> and then even kind of learning about the Pearl and then seeing kind of the connection at the wharf, wharf now between mm. Pearl Street and knowing, learning more about um, that attempted slave escape and what happened there. So it's like that connection I thought was fascinating. I don't do too many spoilers, but you know. I recommend. Um, and so, um, Sarah, you touched a little bit on um, what prompted you to start Prologue DC and kind of getting in and wanting to do more um, public history and all that. Um, I know the, your research a little bit has started to focus more so on civil rights sites, African American sites. How did that pivot start? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of a lot of what we did with the. In, in working the the neighborhood, the DC neighborhood heritage trails encompassed a lot of Black history, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, there. And, and in fact, so in the 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 organization that produced these was Cultural Tourism DC, and the very first uh, there had been a guide to Black history in DC, the African American Heritage Trail um, that had been done that was originally done in two thousand three by Dr. Maria McCorder, uh, and and. Um, and that was sort of, I think, around the founding days of this group, Cultural Tourism DC, that, that then sort of started launching all these neighborhood heritage trails after doing, really focusing in on the U Street corridor, uh, which really hadn't been that, even that history hadn't been that well documented mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. or like very publicly known. Like now we're all like, oh yeah, Black Broadway. Like, of course, everybody knows that, right? But like in the 90s, Actually, like that history was not very visible, mm -hmm. uh, so um, that was sort of where that started. That that neighborhood heritage trail program, and with and with uh, Maria's Maria McCorder's work on the African American heritage trail, um, and then that evolved into. Um, uh, there being plaques placed on 100 different sites around the city uh, marking African American history specifically. Uh, and that work was done uh, by my, my current colleague, Mara Cherkaski, um, under the leadership of Jane Levy at Cultural Tourism DC. Um, and, and in conjunction with that, this big database was produced of all of African American Heritage Trail database. Eventually, that kind of like didn't get stopped being maintained, um, in part because Cultural Tourism DC lost its funding and the, got moved and there wasn't um, whatever, the infrastructure kind of died out. So when the National Park Service started providing grants several years ago mm -hmm. uh, to do work specifically focused on the black history sites and the history of other marginalized groups in um, uh, around the country, uh, we became aware of those that funding that became available uh, and, and worked closely with the DC Historic Preservation Office at the time. Uh, Patsy Fletcher, who you, you may have known, uh, mm -hmm. was, was still there. She had done a lot of really great black history work in DC yeah. um, with, with the DC Historic Preservation mm -hmm. Office. We worked closely with her and uh, Kim Williams there to, uh, to write a grant to, to start doing this, to do a, a civil rights focused um, uh, Actually, it was an online tour of civil rights sites uh, in the district, and we uh, ended up creating a, and so we worked closely with Patsy and Kim to sort of identify um, and really drawing on not, not just Maria's work, but like this work goes, I mean, there's people that, and actually yesterday in the Washington Post, there was such a great article about yeah. the DeForest brothers. Yeah. Yes. I mean, they were really the originals, yes. and I should... Maybe yep, I don't. Yep, we yep. should just talk about that too. Yes. <laughs> um, but so they did this. They were doing this work in the '70s, and they really like built the the infrastructure for this work. Yes. And uh, so we were so and drawing on all that, we then started to you know with really the, the Park Service fi providing funding, um, we we produced the civil rights tour, and then out of that came the um, 
the National Register, this multi-property document that, yeah. that that we worked on together. Yeah, and so yeah. we'll circle back to the DeForest Brothers in just a second, but the multi-property document that we're working on, um, basically it's a framework and it's a context study. So basically, um, whenever a property wants to get listed on the National Register of Historic Places, particularly as part of the theme of civil rights, 20th century civil rights sites in D.C., they'll be able to use this context study as a way to plug into the framework without having to do all of the research that goes into the, the importance of it or the theme. So basically it's a way to help future researchers be able to get more sites added to the National Register of Historic Places a little bit easier. Um, and part of that, that ties into the DeForest Brothers. So the National Register of Historic Places is the, it's maintained by the National Park Service. It's basically the register you need to be on to be eligible to receive federal historic tax credits. It's also kind of the register that tracks our historic places. That's what you want to get on. Um, in the 1970s, there were not that many places on the National Register that celebrated African American heritage or black heritage. And so Vincent DeForest and his brother, they changed that. Because of them, they are responsible for about 75% of the nominations on the National Register that attributed to black and African American culture. So it's like being mindful of who is actually writing the nominations, who's telling the story, who's actually using the tools that exist to make sure that we're expanding the knowledge is huge. Um, and shout out to Amber Riley, who also, also introduced us, um, but she was coded in the article and she is uh, currently at Rutgers, but she's about to be at UPenn as the new director for the Center for the Preservation of Civil Rights Sites. I think I got that right. Um, but she is in contact with the DeFore or with Vincent DeForest and she's been really elevating their story to share that because most people don't realize the importance that they had. Um, and the DeForest Brothers, their organization was um, ABC... African American Bicentennial Thank you. Yes. Derek knows the name. Yep. I was like, oh, ABC. Perfect. Thank you. So, yeah. So, anyways, we digress. Again, we, we can nerd out on historic preservation and history stuff, so bear with us. But that's why you're here. It's great. Um, and so, um, circling then back to, um, let's get into D.C. history a little bit. So, I'm going to go to the next slide. And Derek has some slides. We're going to talk about some population. Oh, hang on. Sorry, this is controlling that All right, so Derek, why don't we get into the population of DC a little bit? Sure, so, so in the slide that you all see in front of you, uh, which the blue line on top is the total population of the city. Uh, I'm really interested in that, that X made by the orange and the white lines. Uh, the orange line is, is a white population of the city. Uh, the gray one is the black population of the city. And that X is really the, the fascinating thing for me because you know, we always talk about, you know, particularly among uh, uh, older African-American residents of the city, young folks sort of start off by saying, like, I'm a native Washingtonian, right? And you get this feel that the entire black population of Washington, D.C. Has, has been here since the 19th century. And then you look at this map and you realize that more than half of the black population of Washington, D.C. got here after 1950, roughly. Right, and so you had a black population of about 198,000 in 1940 at the start of World War II. So it's a large black population, um, but another 300,000 people come in the next 20 years, right? Which gives us the black majority because there's this corresponding white outmigration of, of roughly about 300,000 as well, right? And so that's why you get that giant X. It's really that population change that shifts, you know, among many others, among, you know, sort of other historical developments like the passage of federal civil rights legislation, um, the Supreme Court sh shifting behind uh, uh, civil rights cases. But it's also that population change that gives us a move from civil rights to black power. Uh, and and that, that's a it's a long conversation. I don't want to make this no, this answer good. too long. Oh, I'm good. You're okay. Good. Um, but but the basic idea is that you know when the black population is is this sort of pronounced minority, um, there is a large liberal white population that that's sort of trying to figure out, particularly in the midst of the Cold War, how we can create a a semi multicultural society in which there's there's rough e e equality of opportunity. Um, and that, that's, that's reasonably comfortable, I think, for the white majority because they would never be subsumed by a black majority population. They, they wouldn't have to worry too much about being ruled by black people, which, by the way, in the 1940s and 1950s is, is nutso for, for a lot of white Americans. Um, 
On the other side of things, uh, you have a, a black population that, that realizes because it's a minority that it has to work with the white majority. And it's looking for friends, it's looking for people that it can work with, right? Particularly among middle class African Americans. Once you get that population shift, uh, it, that dynamic is just gone. Um, the vast majority of the white population is sequestered on the far side of Rock Creek Park after, after, all the, after those 300,000 white uh, DC residents leave. They don't really have to interact with black DC in the same way that they had when you actually had people in transitioning neighborhoods in the center of the city. Um, and those 300,000 new African Americans much poorer than the, the people that they're coming to live next to who are black, um, are coming from North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, parts of Maryland, um, and they're just not even thinking about integrated living in the same way that, that some of the black folks who have been living in DC may have uh, prior to them. Um, plus, by 1970, there's 70 plus percent of the population what are we even talking about here, right? I mean, th there's no need for friends when you're 70% of the population. You just do what you want and everybody else kind of has to agree. Um, and so, so all of that really you know, spoke to, uh, th these demographic changes spoke to the, the changing politics of the city in a way that I thought was very helpful to sort of foreground. And so that's why I wanted to put that up first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this was super helpful in terms of also just looking at the change, change over time. because that's the thing that keep, I, I keep reminding myself that everything is changing over time. Historic preservation, even as a field, it's not about keeping things stagnant. It's about how do we actually um, sensitively manage change, because uh, everything is always changing. And so before we jump ahead to black power, though, um, I wanted to jump uh, back to civil rights a little bit. And so I know a lot of people think of them as one and the same, them being civil rights the civil rights movement and the black power movement, often they're thought of as one and the same. Um, but I know, Sarah, for our civil rights um, context study, we had a very particular period of significance. Um, so would you go ahead and talk a little bit about what framed that significance? Yes, and actually, Derek was instrumental in that framing, yeah, if you recall, <laughs> because we called on him early right, in the process right, yeah. to yeah. decide <laughs> what the criteria were going to be um, for this study, uh, because uh, you know, it's um, uh, there's we ha we had to establish some boundaries, right? So so uh, Derek very helpfully sort of defined you know what we meant by the history of organizing for civil rights, um, and I think you said specifically this is like uh, the struggle to guarantee you know the rights uh, the of, that were supposed to be guaranteed by the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendments. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. um, so these, this was about, and it was mostly about integration and, and demands for equal, equal treatment. Uh, and so we're looking at themes like uh, desegregating the schools, you know, equal education, equal employment, uh, voting rights, mm -hmm. um, criminal justice, or what I think the, or is also now referred to by the Park Service in their thematic study, criminal injustice. Uh, and so we actually, and I think that that's actually one area that is less included traditionally in talking about the history of civil rights organizing, uh, organizing around uh, police brutality. Um, I think that's more commonly associated with the black power movement, but in fact, people, that has been a really central issue since the beginning of the 20th century, and, and we, we pulled that out a lot in, in the civil rights study, um, mm -hmm. like the work that the NAACP was doing in the 1950s here in DC, uh, for example. Uh, and so in the, in the time period that we set was 1912, which was uh, when the uh, DC branch of the NAACP was established uh, at a time of rising segregation. And, uh, um, uh, and I guess it was, well, you could say more about it, but I'll say, <laughs> um, uh, so 1912 uh, to 1974, uh, which with the, um, uh, inauguration of our first home rule government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that was one of the things we wanted to make sure that we um, expanded on, particularly being in D.C., is that D.C. still to this day has some legislative issues in terms of taxation without representation. And so when we're talking about civil rights sites, or civil rights particularly in D.C., we needed to make sure we ex included home rule. And it wasn't just going to end with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And so that was part of that. Um, and then, so Derek, in terms of black power, um, would you talk a little bit about that period of significance and how you were defining kind of that period of black power? Sure. So 
It, oddly enough, I, I had some of the same difficulties when it came to definition as, as, as Sarah uh, mm -hmm. uh, and Nikita did uh, when it came to black power. Um, so I started this off just as the idea to put together a, a website. I wanted to create a map of all of the major black power events and organizations that ever existed in the city uh, during the black power era, which I'm dating from roughly 1966 <laughs> to roughly 1976, uh, right? Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the date that people typically choose for the start of the black power movement is when Stokely Carmichael uh, you know, calls for black power on the Meredith March against fear in Greenwood, Mississippi. And then 76 is when a lot of the, the more radical black power organizations begin to really fall apart. Um, and that's a national definition. You know, that, that's, that's basing the definition on things that happened in Mississippi and organizations that fell apart in New Jersey. Uh, and I really wanted to create sort of a local definition because my website was going to be all about the, the DC Black Power Movement. Um, and so what I decided was I'm actually going to start in 1961, uh, oddly enough, because that was the year that the Nation of Islam had actually been working, which is the, the primary black nationalist organization in the country for most of the 20th century. Um, and it had really tried to do a huge recruitment drive in the district. Um, as part of that big recruitment drive, it had built uh, a mosque on New Jersey Avenue, which is, is now uh, a, a, um, um, an Orthodox uh, Muslim mosque. So it's no longer part of the nation. The nation's mosque is out in uh, Ward 8 um, on Alabama Avenue. Um, but, but they had built it. They had had these huge uh, events at the Uline Arena. I mean, Malcolm X is speaking to like 12,000 people at Uline Arena. Elijah Muhammad is coming to town and doing rallies at Griffith Stadium. So 61 made, made sense as, as a starting point. And then as, as I tried to find an end point, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was largely because the, the, the people who had staffed the Black Power Movement not only built the district government, government but then they took it over. I mean, if you, if you look at uh, our second mayor, Marion Barry, he's the first black power activist in the country to become a mayor of a major American city, over 100,000 uh, people. Um, and this is, this is 1979. This is a couple of weeks after uh, he's been sworn in. And who comes to town? Well, the, the international revolutionary <laughs> Pan-Africanist, um, his old buddy, Kwame Torre, because of course, Stokely Carmichael had changed his name at that point to Kwame Torre. Um, and he's in town to host African Liberation Day, which is sort of a staple of the black power movement in the district and continues all the way into the 1990s, right? It, the first one is in 1972. I think the last one is in maybe 1999. That's in dispute among the people I've talked to. Um, and so I decided that the best thing to do was to say that it starts in 61 and we end roughly in 1998. And that's when Marion Barry decides not to run for reelection. Um, that's when the year that Stokely Carmichael passes away. Uh, he has a very aggressive form of cancer and, and has his last major event in the city. And it's right about when big events like African Liberation Day begin a decline until they, they, they essentially close down. So I see Black Power as a generational movement here in the district. And it's key defining features. You know, uh, Sarah talked about sort of getting the rights of the, the, the Reconstruction Amendments. The key defining features of black power are three things, uh, just like three amendments. <clears throat> it's black self-defense in a moment that's rife with police brutality. Um, it's black self-love uh, at a time when American public schools are still assigning books like Little Black Sambo to elementary school kids, right? Um, and it is um, uh, black self-determination uh, at a time when the city is ruled by segregationists in Congress, right? And so the black power movement is really focused on projecting those things, uh, gaining those things for the African-American community. And they work on it for an entire generation and it shapes district politics for that entire time. Mm -hmm. Wild, listen. This is why they're here. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just like, even just hearing that and thinking also about um, how the DC government has changed. And the idea that DC was run by, at one point in time, a committee of three appointed by the president, segregationists. And part of the reason why DC wasn't given the vote was because 
basically there's too many black people here, they're not going to know how to vote, that sort of thing. Um, the fact that what is now Alexandria got retrocessioned back to Virginia because white landowners wanted to be able to vote and hold slaves. So it's like there's a number of politics and policies that have shaped physically the shape of D.C. Um, and then also the way that it's run and all that. So anyway, sorry, I digress. Anything else you want to add is fine. But if not, I'm going to go back to the questions. Please. Um, all right, so on to the next one. Let me go back a slide because um, there was one more slide you wanted to chat through. I'm sorry, I can't see. And so this one is, um, you see an architect holding a, a <laughs> blueprint. Uh, say more. <laughs> so I, I think we can both claim this one. Do you want to you try and uh, oh, this one? do it together? Uh, or, or would you prefer that? Because it is. You start. She'll okay. add on. Um, so, so the gentleman on uh, your right is, of course, Walter Fauntroy, uh, the pastor of New Bethel Baptist Church, uh, now emeritus and, and, and semi-retired. Um, and, and our former non-voting delegate to um, uh, Congress. Uh, of course, we've only had two, and they've been some of the most remarkable political minds uh, in the Congress, uh, 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 Walter Fontray and then Eleanor Holmes Norton. Um, and they're standing uh, in Shaw. I, I, I can't tell you the exact location uh, top of mine. Um, and they're there as part of uh, an initiative by the Model Inner City Community Organization, so MICO. Uh, MICO was an organization founded by Walter Fontre. It was really sort of a large umbrella organization. And its purpose was to take control of the urban renewal process in Shaw. Um, I know all of you know about urban renewal and what it did to Southwest Washington, D.C. in the 1950s. Southwest was this, the country's first urban renewal site. And the, uh, what federal planners did there, essentially, is they went into a 75% African-American, majority poor community, and they just bulldozed it, except for the churches. I mean, that's why everything in Southwest looks like it was built in the 60s, because it was, <laughs> except right. for the churches. Right. They bulldozed it, displaced all of those people. Uh, and when they rebuilt it, they rebuilt it in a way that, you know, basically federal bureaucrats would be able to walk to work. And so when it was repopulated, it was repopulated as 75 percent white and largely middle class. In other words, they kicked all the poor people out. And many of those poor people landed in places like Shaw. Right. Um, when those folks landed in Shaw, um, all of a sudden the federal government says, well, we're going to do a huge urban renewal site in Shaw. And everyone understood what had happened in Southwest. It wasn't a mystery. This 23,000 people were displaced in, in urban renewal in, in, in Southwest, right? And Shaw is bigger and more dense, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so Fontroy began lobbying to try and make sure that, that local people controlled the urban renewal process. And so they got the dollars, they got the rebuilding, uh, but they didn't get displaced. Uh, and he teamed up with a lot of local churches, a lot of activist organizations, he even brought Martin Luther King to town to lobby for this. Um, and they're able to get control for a few years. I, I think uh, it was roughly three or four years where they had solid control over the process. Now, Shaw today, just to give you an idea of their impact, um, is one of the fastest gentrifying parts of the city. Um, but the reason that it's not totally gentrified, the reason that there are still poor people that live in Shaw today is because of the work of MICO. All of the low income scatter site housing that's built right next to the black churches in Shaw, most of that was built by this organization with those urban renewal dollars, right? And it was part of this idea that black folks should have self-determination, uh, both political and economic. And that meant being able to own and operate your own home so nobody could kick you out. Right. Um, and that has at least played out as this new sort of round of, of, of market driven displacement uh, has has really pushed most poor people out of Shaw, not the folks who live in those houses. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so then again, next one, next one. Um, and so we're going to pivot to that because we'll come back and we're going to um, end on Berry Farm. And I'm just kind of looking at the time and surprised at how fast it's going. We have about 10 minutes left before we open up for a Q&A. Um, right, right? It flies, I'm telling you. Um, and so I wanted to put this map up just to show the spread of the different sites and kind of their geographic location of the 20th century civil rights sites throughout the city. So you can really see they're really located all over, um, all over the city. 
Um, and I don't know, is our is the contact study public yet? We've gotten approval. I don't know. That we'll find links for it and post it if they're available. But if not, it will be soon. Yeah, because it's gonna be it's gonna um, live at the on the national park website or the national park service website. Um, and there are a couple other context studies and things there. But, you know, just we'll check out the Instagram. We'll put some links in the show notes. <laughs> but um, the next site we wanted to talk about and pivot to um, is Berry Farm. Um, and so this is a site that's in Anacostia in southeast D.C. Um, and Sarah is a part of the D.C. Legacy Project that is helping to um, work on this. So I will pivot to you. Yeah, so this is a project that I've been really engaged in uh, uh, for the past few years, um, uh, because this, so, so Berry Farm is a public housing development uh, built on the site of a historic black community that dates to 1867. Uh, this was the only place in the country where the, the federal government, Freedmen's Bureau, purchased land. They actually purchased 375 acres of land, much more than, than much more, more than where the public housing is. Um, for the express purpose of black land ownership. So the, 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 the land was subdivided and sold individual lots to black families. Uh, and there was a long-standing, thriving black community there uh, that, uh, um, that sort of got increasingly divided over the years by highway building and, and other um, infrastructure projects, uh, cut, lost access to the river. Um, it, had been right, it had been abutting the Anacostia River. Um, and eventually, in 1941, you have the construction of a, a public housing project uh, on land that was still black owned, uh, but then was taken back by the federal government using eminent domain uh, from 23 landowners that were on that site uh, to build this public housing complex uh, that has um, really itself been a very rich site of organizing uh, around civil rights and anti-poverty organizing. Uh, and, um, and so we were able to make a case to the Historic Preservation Review Board uh, in the midst of this uh, public housing project being demolished uh, that, that some of it should be saved uh, uh, as... Um, uh, as you know, the homes of people that were really central in the uh, civil rights organizing in the district and tenant organizing, uh, including uh, uh, people who were plaintiffs in the in DC's Bowling v. Sharp case, which was DC's companion case to Brown v. Board of Education. Um, a lot of the, the the organizing for that case came out of the Berry Farm community. Um, uh, uh, tenant, organi tenant organizer named Etta Horn, uh, who lived also in one of these units, um, who went on to found the National Welfare Rights Organization. Uh, so uh, we've, so, uh, and, and to tell the story, the longer story of this community, because there's really hardly any remnants of the, the longer reconstruct, the, the reconstruction era community there at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to hold this up as an example of um, of the kind of preservation work that's being done now that's really like becoming much more focused on you know it's not the it was it was surprising actually to me that that uh, that this site was designated um, because it's really you know to look at the buildings uh, they're not typical of, of the kind of buildings that are going to be saved uh, for historic preservation but there was a very I, I, I really um, thank the the community who came out and supported it. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I, I sort of laid out the history, but the, if it weren't for all the people that came to that hearing mm -hmm. and really, you know, just spoke on um, on how important this site was, uh, uh, you know, I don't think it would have happened. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for just for the stories that this place holds. Yeah. And so one of the things that this uh, site also highlights is the idea that uh, preservation, particularly in this country, is on a sliding scale. And typically from an age value, the building has to be at least 50 years old or older to be considered historic. Um, and so we're up to, you know, 73. So buildings built before 1973 could be eligible to be historic. But also one of the things that Sarah and I found while we were doing the contact study, a lot of times um, preservation as a field has put more significance on the physical architecture and the integrity of the building itself, as opposed to the other six criteria that can go to whether or not something has integrity from a historic preservation standpoint. And so when we're doing this work, we had to think about that and the fact of what does it mean for sites that um, were, have been systematically disinvested in 
that were built uh, for people who were not meant to be permanently there, that were not built to be architecturally significant or whatever, but they were still culture and history and important things that happened there, but they may not have the same architectural significance. So how do we, um, how do we make sure that we are blending preservation and using the tool and expanding it so that we're not um, causing more harm by ignoring the stories because the building isn't pretty enough like this building that we're in. Um, and so it's like, how do we recognize that there are scales to architecture, scales to history that need to be preserved at multiple levels? Um, and so all that to say, preservation is um, as a field is evolving. Um, the conversations we're having here, the types of history that we're going to keep talking about are is going to keep changing and it's going to start feeling a little bit more like memory than history as time keeps going on. Uh, but it's still work that's incredibly important that needs to be done. Um, one other thing, I'll, I, a fact I learned at the um, architecture festival for Berry Farm, uh, there is a documentary that's being made <clears> about <throat> the uh, site that will be available publicly at some point in time. I think we have yeah, a couple more routes. Fairly soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, but for those of you who are, who are familiar with DC and Go Go Music, um, the Junkyard Band actually started at Berry Farm as well and was very instrumental. So, Berry Farm also, um, we can thank them for the Junkyard Band. Yeah, Go Go Music. <laughs> Um, so with that, I know we are at 7 o'clock. I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for questions. I believe there is a mic somewhere um, over here. Yep, there we go. Awesome. So um, any questions before we close out? Of course, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> a layered one. Uh, first, I just wanted to ask Sarah, have you, are you familiar at all with the Birmingham, Alabama, Civil Rights Trail signage that Rene Kemprotan uh, delivered throughout the city. It's a wonderful um, signage program. If you're not, it would be worth a look. Um, I'm concerned about erasure. Mm -hmm. And the work that you all are each doing is about the preservation of culture and events and places that were significant to the black community and black population, mm -hmm. but yet at a policy level, whether it's urban renewal and eminent domain or their iterations that exist today, um, as you work to preserve certain things, how are you addressing the stoppage of erasure from a policy standpoint? That's a fantastic question. Um, and it's also a layered one. Um, and so a part of it, I think, is also being able to have the conversations with the um, policymakers, the legislators, to help them see it. Because unfortunately, a lot of times, it's like, oh, well, this is how it's always been done. Why is that a problem? And it's like, well, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, or when preservation was at its infancy, a lot of times, white preservationists would do window surveys or windshield surveys where they'd be too scared to get out of their car to then go survey a black area or a black neighborhood. And so they'd be like, oh, there might be something historic over there. Okay, fine. We'll call that a resource or something. But then the sites that they actually are comfortable getting out of their car and surveying, those become a resource. And the resources are the ones that get the money, but the sites, might, you know, they need further investigation. So it's like, how do we make sure that we are um, pointing out the inconsistencies and bringing those to the attention of people who could actually change some policies um, is part of it. I don't know if you guys have any additional. Well, I guess I, I also took your question to be asking, uh, you know, maybe how are we addressing the the current erasure of of the black population from D.C. and I and I would say that in this this project and and another. Um, a project, the uh, preservation of the, the Cremel School, a historic black school in, in uh, the Ivy City neighborhood, uh, were both projects that were carried out by an organization called Empower DC that primarily works on, you know, works with uh, uh, people who are residents of public housing, are, are low income people to, to be able to stay in the district and to be housed. Uh, uh, and uh, so what they have found that uh, organizing around the preservation of historic black sites is a very valuable exercise in, uh, in establishing the long standing presence of these people here and their right to stay here. Um, and it's also uh, very empowering for, for um, these you know, people who have lived in these places who may not know, you know, may not have dug that deeply into the history, but to really understand, um, you know, the, the 
their own history goes back a long way, right? And and so and and they and the vision for this is not just to save the buildings, but is actually to activate them in a way that actually benefit, you know, allows uh, people who used to live in here to come back and engage in in activating their futures here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Just listening to uh, your presentation, it is just so inspiring how rich black history is, American history. And I was wondering, there seems to be an assault on black history in the colleges and schools, uh, Florida, but there's also about a half a dozen or more states with pending uh, legislation to mimic what they're doing in Florida. Uh, if anyone on the panel, do you have a, a sense of urgency or renewed determination to teach black history in this era of suppressing black history? I, so I've, I've always had a, a, a pretty strong determination to do this. I mean, I've, I've always taught a pretty controversial history. My first book was on black elect, elected officials claims that the, the feds and the cops were out to get them, <laughs> uh, which is why I, I focused on Marion Barry and Walter Fontre before I got here to the city, because both of them were investigated by the Department of Justice under the Reagan and Bush administrations. Um, I, th I think this new moment you know, speaks to history that, that informs activists. And, and the more that I've written local history, the more I've, I've been thinking in that way. And so, I, you know, Chris and I would write articles on statehood, and we, we were hoping that statehood activists were reading these articles. And perhaps DC residents who weren't statehood activists would read them and become such. Uh, when we were writing about gentrification, it was the same thing. I mean, our, our first article that we ever wrote together back in 2012, I think it was, was called Not, Not Gone, Not Forgotten, which really speaks to, to Sarah's point, which, you know, we were arguing that. Um, you know, you forget people when they get pushed out of an area, right? I think the first line was, who remembers the Irish of Swamp Poodle? Who remembers Swamp Poodle, by the way, right? <laughs> but Swamp Poodle was an area, it was a neighborhood right near uh, Union Station, sort of behind it. Um, there was a it's sort of scrappy Irish neighborhood, right? And once you build Union Station at the dawn of the, the 20th century, um, that neighborhood gets, gets obliterated. Um, and, and the worry was that, you know, the same thing that had happened to the Irish of Swamp Poodle or the black community of Georgetown uh, was going to happen to Shaw as we were writing at that moment. Um, and that's kind of played out, right? But, but the idea was always, and this is not for the Ron DeSantis folks who just are just looking for a good way to, to, to gin up you know, uh, votes as they prepare to run for president. Um, this was like to Muriel Bowser, you know, this was to the council, uh, is to say, if you don't want these people to be forgotten, if you're serious about gentrification, then make sure they don't get displaced, pass policies that make sure that these folks don't get pushed out. And here's the history that shows you what, you, what will happen if you don't do anything. Um, that, I still feel that when I write. Um, uh, the, the DeSantis folks, I mean, I. They're not stupid. He was, a, he was a history major at Yale, for God's sake, right? The best history department in the country. Um, he's just a craven, you know, he's a craven individual. He's a racist, by the way. Yeah, and for me, one of the things that um, I've been exploring and enjoying about doing the podcast is being able to reach different demographics of people about this kind of information. Because the kids today who are on TikTok, they're not reading the, the pithy <laughs> research papers and whatever. Um, and so being able to have different ways to reach different generations with different learning styles um, is something that I've been more excited about. And also it's something that I'm, um, TikTok, the internet, all of that's gonna be here. So thankfully they can ban the books they want, but the internet, the kids are still gonna get the resources. So there's that. Yes. Hi, I'm Daryl. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. This was an incredibly interesting program. Okay. Uh, so you all are aware of the balloons being shot down last week, <laughs> so, so you're saying, oh, how's Daryl going to connect the balloons <laughs> with this subject matter? So anyway, one of the balloons that was shot down was over Alaska, the Arctic Circle, and I was working there with indigenous people who wanted their own hospital. 
Okay, so my question is about black hospitals, actually. So I'm going to, that's how I'm going to come back in. Okay. You know, but they're in the state of Alaska, and the state, every state defines what a hospital is. Huh. Okay, there is no federal definition for a hospital. So the state of Alaska defined a hospital, and these indigenous people who I was working with, they said, we want to control our own health care. We want a hospital. Mm -hmm. But the way the Alaska legislation was written, these indigenous people could not have their own hospital. So my question is about my interest in black hospitals. And so there are approximately a thousand, there were, have been approximately a thousand black hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, most of them in the south. I was doing some work trying to understand black hospitals in Los Angeles. I'm from Los Angeles. And because during segregation, uh, black physicians could not practice in white hospitals, black people could not go to mm -hmm. white hospitals. And so a number of black physicians in Los Angeles just converted their garages mm -hmm. into what they call hospitals. Gotcha. Okay, they, they expanded their, their, their homes because people could not have access to mm -hmm. hospitals. So here we know Howard, we know Friedman's Bureau, but the question is, have you all done any work? Have you heard of any projects on black hospitals in the District of Columbia? Because when I look on your population map, so from 1920 to 19, 40 or whatever, there are 100,000 black people and then 200,000 black people. They all needed health care. Mm -hmm. They could not go to white hospitals mm -hmm. for the, those 200,000 people were having babies, right. right? Where were those babies born? Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious from a preservation standpoint, uh, has anyone or do you all know of people who have looked at black hospitals mm -hmm. other than Howard and other than St. Elizabeth's right. because there are probably black hospitals mm -hmm. all over the District of Columbia. Right. Where were they? Has anyone photographed them? Are they part of the register that you're talking gotcha. about? Gotcha. That's a great question. Um, I don't know offhand, but now I'm really curious to find out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So, I mean, I mean, black folks have a, so, so the simple answer is I have no idea. <laughs> but what, what, I can say, what I can say is this. I mean, you, you know, you, there were a lot of black folks that went to DC General, uh, which if you all were living in, if, if for those of you who were living in the city at the time, you remember the brouhaha when, when uh, Anthony Williams moved to, to close down DC General and, and the council um, and the control board. Because uh, it was, I think it was their last major act. Because uh, he he sort of needed them to step in because he didn't really have the 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 political uh, coalition to do it himself, and so he sort of asked them to kind of come in and help him shut it down. And it was a, it was a an absolute sinkhole for for city money. I mean, from a financial standpoint, which is his discipline, that's why he did it. But because it was the district's public hospital. And remember, black folks were largely clustered on the east side of the city after the 1960s. And so Friedman, Friedman's then Howard and then the D.C. General were sort of the black hospitals. Um, you have, you know, families where you could find two and three people, two and three generations, pardon me, who, who had, you know, been born at, at D.C. General. It really meant a great deal to them. Um, as far as those smaller hospitals, you know, that sort of grow into community institutions, I've heard about those in other cities. I have not heard about those in the district. And I suspect that the reason is because DC had one of the best black federally funded hospitals in the country, which was Friedman's, then, then Howard. Um, and, and so you just, you just didn't need, you know, a level of care that was far less reliable uh, that, that folks had to sort of stand up in other places. Um, 
but that's the best I could tell. And we did have, there were a lot of black doctors practicing in their own homes. And um, that's something that uh, in working on the uh, historic district nomination for the Bloomingdale area, which is uh, just immediately south of the Howard University campus, um, that is one of the things that we talked about were the English basements and what they had been used for. And many of them had been used as doctor's offices by black families. Uh, and I know, um, uh, yeah, I, I'll, well, I'll stop there. I, 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 it's going to say a little bit more about one of those black doctors who I well I I did I do recall finding a news story about one of those black doctors who was married to quite a prominent artist uh, who had been arrested for uh, providing abortions uh, in his in his home practice. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. How's everybody doing? I'm, I'm Garfield Peart. I'm I'm actually uh, um, an architect as well. Um, I went to Howard. Uh, so Republic Gardens, Ritz, <laughs> definitely feeling that. Um, I, I focus on uh, preservation in Atlanta. I was on the, the uh, Atlanta Urban Design Commission for a number of years uh, as, um, as an activist there, as well as much of my practice is, is with preserva uh, preservation. So certainly the civil rights history in Atlanta um, is, is rich with these type of stories. And um, there's a host of individuals uh, pre Martin Luther King and certainly post Martin Luther King, including Coretta Scott King, uh, who really, you know, uh, influenced legislators and other people to uh, get the Park Service to come in and, for example, to mm -hmm. take. It was a black architect that worked with Coretta Scott King to have the the, the King National Historic Site designated by, you know, as a national site. Uh, hence support of the Park Service. So, um, and I'm also, uh, but even today, I mean, you touched on DeSantis and what he's trying to do in Florida, uh, is very evident that we are a Republican state. You know, um, we're certainly in a minority in the uh, capital, uh, it, but Atlanta is like this black jewel, right? <laughs> it's, you know, uh, that's also being gentrified, but there's, there's a, a jewel uh, among, in this oasis. Um, but even with that strong Republican presence, we now have, for the first time, a black senator and a Jewish senator <laughs> as our two senators. Mm -hmm. and, and I already see, and I've been there 20 years, I already see the impact such as both of them just co-sponsored a bill out of the Inflation Reduction Act for $84 million going towards HBCUs mm -hmm. uh, in, in Georgia. Uh, so we, we now have a way to, um, and an advocate mm -hmm. uh, here on the Hill to, to, to get more funding and, and to really highlight some of the, uh, the sites that are so important to us. Um, being in DC, and you touched on it, um, uh, <laughs> The history of why D.C. is not a state and why we were not given the right to vote, you, you touched on it, that it was so predominantly black that they felt that they wouldn't know how to vote. So let's keep them, um, you know, in the shadows. Uh, I guess my question is this. How important, whereas in Georgia we have access to the Hill, we have access uh, as a state, obviously, how is important, how important is statehood? And you touched on it to, because um, I wasn't, when I was at Howard, I didn't know a whole lot of DC history. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't, mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't something that was highlighted to us. Uh, um, obviously we were in Shaw, you know, mm -hmm. where Howard is. And uh, back then, you know, we were, you know, you kind of sought that information out yourself. Mm -hmm. But how important is statehood to uh, advancing the work that you're doing in terms of getting funding, in terms of mm -hmm. getting the support in the Hill, because DC is very much in the, still in the shadow of, of the federal government. Right. Um, I'll start with it from a tax credit standpoint. Um, so within preservation, the historic tax credit is a big, um, a big financial incentive for developers to actually reuse existing and historic buildings, um, or I guess particularly historic buildings. Um, most states, ha not most, the majority of states have state historic tax credits that can then be um, comp or compiled on top of the federal historic tax credit. Since DC is not a state, DC does not have access to that portion of money. So in order to be able to um, get tax credits, they have to be 
federally listed or on the national register. Um, whereas at the state level, if you have a property that is important to the state, you can get tax credits at the state level, even without the federal level. So without having a DC as a state, there's less capital for redevelopment to preserve historic buildings or adaptively reuse historic buildings. That's one of the ways that statehood is impacting it. Or lack of statehood, I guess. Yeah. I'm referring to the expert on yeah, that. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Hi, thank you so much. Um, one of the great things about studying the history of places is that the, the, I guess the meaning or the significance of them can change over time, and sometimes in ironic ways. So I think of like Fort Monroe, which was the first site where, where slaves were brought in the US, and then later in the Civil War was a place where many were freed. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any examples in DC history of any places that have represented both black liberation and black oppression at different points in their history? I know, right? I want to say yes, but not right now. Like I'm thinking, like, yeah, no, like, it's definitely a both and. I mean, this is this is not prob this is not the example that you would be looking for, but I'll just say it because it's been so central to my work. Has been uh, uh, looking at house houses that were the subject of cases around racially restrictive deed covenants mm -hmm. dc so i did a i worked on a historic district designation for the bloomingdale neighborhood and it was based in part on bloomingdale being an epicenter of legal challenges to restrictive covenants but of course it was an epicenter of these legal challenges because it was full of racial covenants, right? <laughs> like it was built as an exclusively white neighborhood uh, with and uh, with these, you know, legally binding agreements written into the deeds, barring the the buyers of those homes to to sell or convey in any way their property to black people. Uh, but there it was, right next to Howard University, the law school, Charles Hamilton Houston. This, his student was Thurgood Marshall. I mean, this whole cadre of attorneys who knew these same people that were trying to move into these houses, um, there it, it becomes the, the place where all of these, these cases are playing out. So it's both of those things. Um, I, I, I remember, thank goodness uh, you, you uh, <laughs> played interference there. Um, um, and, and great example. Um, so Meridian Hill Park slash Malcolm X Park. Um, the park is created in, in large part to get rid of the poor people that are on this hill across the street from a very sumptuous mansion of a senator whose wife is dabbling in real estate. Mm -hmm. And she wants to redevelop the entire area as a high-end um, uh, district um, and make a little money along the way. And so she works through her husband to essentially get this park built and they seize the land, uh, displace all of these poor people who live you know, right along what's now Utah Street uh, and other parts of the park, and many of them are African-American. Um, and it's this site of you know, displacement. And in the 1960s and 70s, it is like ground zero for the Black Power Movement because it's, it's the biggest green space um, in the middle of the blackest part of the city. I mean, Shaw is, is far and away the blackest part of the city uh, in the 19, 1960s and 70s. And so you've got the, the Black Panther Party when they have their Revolutionary Constitutional Convention here in the district, they have a concert in the park. Um, you, know, you can find old pictures of black power activists who had their weddings in the park. You know, Black nationalists like Doug Moore, the, the form, previously a city councilman, would be officiating at these things, right? African Liberation Day is held there uh, every single May. Um, the drum circle met there every single Sunday from like 1965, and you know, depending on if you give them a couple of days off, down to a couple of years ago, right? Um, and so it was like this little black area, right? I mean, it just became, it became literally Malcolm X Park. Um, mm -hmm. Local folks decided that they were gonna rename it and they were so forceful about it that the local papers just said, yeah, everybody calls it Malcolm X Park now, so we're gonna call it Malcolm X Park. Um, and, and eventually the National Park Service adopted that name as well. Um, and so that's one of those places where you really see sort of a, a site of, uh, um, you know, black, black oppression turn into a site of black emancipation. Mm -hmm. awesome. This is terrific, thanks so much. Um, my question is a National Register question, but before I jump into that, the hospital comment, I don't know about the individual hospitals, but I do know that as part of the redevelopment of St. Elizabeth's, the West Campus, that is now um, the Department of Homeland Security, 
there has been tremendous documentation of the separation of the segregation and treatment. Um, so in the documentation that's been prepared since 2005, um, where they were housed, how they were housed, who um, the the um, the um, sorry blanking, but the um, sort of the priorities. They're not only documented on paper, but they're documented within the buildings themselves. So, and GSA has done a lot of that documentation. So, um, happy to help you with that. Isn't the pre-Civil War cemetery on the grounds. Yes. They're not segregated. They buried black and white soldiers next to each other. Yes. With Jim Kane in there. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Take the mic, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the question was for St. Elizabeth's whether, well, there's a pre-Civil War cemetery. There's um, a headstone from the Seminole War of a black soldier, but uh, there was no discrimination in the burial of, of black and whites together. And um, I found that to be uh, spiritually um, <laughs> enlivening, yes. uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. walking through. And I took some really beautiful black and white photographs in there, which if you're done. She, she, she hasn't asked the question yet. <laughs> okay. So there's, there is a lot of documentation on that. But back to your question about the National Register, I work in federal preservation. And the challenge that we are having is that in federal courthouses, the cases have to meet the 50 year. If they don't meet the 50 years, then they have to, they're, they're evaluated at the exceptional significance level. And we are not being very successful with that. And this is recent history. This is highly significant mm -hmm. history, but because we're still we're still challenged by that threshold. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is, are you seeing any movement in the National Register, um, whether it's under criteria A or the 50 years to say it's either significant or it's not and don't apply the 50 years? Mm -hmm. Got you. So I know it's been lots of conversations. I haven't seen much change in terms of what actually gets designated or um, an approval for the nomination. Um, I'm curious how that's going to keep evolving, particularly as significant moments in history keep happening a little bit faster, it seems. Um, you know, we're going to have to acknowledge these things somehow, even in terms of there have been conversations of, well, how do we think about preserving sites about related to COVID? in this very seminal moment in human history that's gonna have ripple effects going forward. What does that look like from a preservation standpoint and all that? Um, but I'll have to say, I, I know there's been conversations. I haven't seen any successes yet, but I will keep those in mind and connect with you to make sure. Yeah. I was beginning to talk about these photographs that I was able to shoot in the cemetery, which again are kind of beautiful for what they are. My question is, Reflecting on our first session with Andrew Filer and Brent Legs about the book that Filer did and the power of the black and white photographs that he presented in his book and at the talk, I wonder how photography fits into not just from pure, you know, documentation of the place, but the artful capture almost in an honorific way yeah. of the place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for the so both of these contact studies, we have a database of sites that each of the database includes a photograph, the address, where it was, and a little bit more information about the building itself. That's my domain so much of the, the work. I get to look at the buildings themselves. Um, and so really being able to capture them as a moment in time. But a lot of times what happens is um, the research is done, and then we try to find the building, and the building's no longer there. Or um, the building, the important part of the building happened in a, a room of a building or a floor of the building, and now it's a big office building or something like that. So we can't necessarily say the whole building would be considered historic because the piece is really not the entire building. So it's figuring out the context of it. Um, but yeah, the, for those of you who haven't um, seen the recording up from December, um, he was talking about the Rosenwald schools and the partnership between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. And he has, I think he photographed a couple hundred of the schools that are still extant or existing. And most of them are, you know, falling down. The, anyways, it's an amazing thing. Um, but yes, we are trying to document what's currently here. They're not necessarily the black and white beautiful photos. A lot of them are Google Street View. Here's what it was a moment, moment in time. Um, but kind of documenting it of this time so we can have it as a record for the research that will continue to happen going forward. 
Um, and with that, I'm getting the, the nod. So thank you. Well, so, I, yeah. actually, before we end, <clears throat> I do want to say it's not a lot of money, but we did get a very small grant from the AIA Historic Resources Committee, the Architects Foundation, several years ago. In the event that there is an, a historic building in peril and the AIA endorses its preservation and is unsuccessful, we do have a pot of money if there has to be an emergency attempt to do like HABS type Good documentation before HABS can get to it. Mm -hmm. We have a little bit of bridge funding to help with that. So since so many of you are in that field, but um, Stephen ended with a fantastic question, but if you would like a, a, another minute to thank our guests on behalf of the board of the foundation, please do. Thank you, Marcy, and I absolutely, excuse me, Garfield, absolutely would. Um, these stories, whenever they're daylit, the beneficiaries of these stories are us, and it leaves us with a mixture of emotions, um, certainly undergirding it all because of you all and the work you've done and the manner in which you're able to communicate it immediately instills a sense of pride uh, in the fact that someone's carrying this torch. And um, Derek, you know, just watching your body language as you recall these things, uh, this evolution of arriving with no thing and getting thrown into the fire is just a great story. Um, uh, Sarah, you know, you're in the trenches, you know, just like, fighting this stuff out and coming out with with product it has to surface mm -hmm. and this is a great opportunity to have it surface i want to thank all of you guys for attending we have um an upcoming third talk which has not been calendared yet but that i'm sure you'll be very interested in you all as well uh about the african burial ground site in new york city and how that has led to uh just a whole series of burial grounds being discovered um being prevented from being turned under again and being curated uh, by my uh, colleague Peggy King Jordy. And uh, so with that, thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you all.